Stanford University. Thank you, Michelle, for the uh, generous introduction. Um, I can correct only one thing. It wasn't so much that I chose mentoring as it chose me. And I guess that will be part of the story. Um, as you know, a professor's, or one of the professor's primary nightmares is getting up before an audience to address them on a subject about which probably the majority of them know more than he or she does. And I cannot claim to come here with a long history in mentoring, so I'll admit right off the bat, I'm sure there are people here who do know more than I do. What I will try and do is justify uh, why I'm here before you and what I have learned about mentoring in the past two years, which I, which I think is a reasonable amount, and try and raise a bunch of issues and hopefully engender some discussion following it. Um, make sure everything works. The introduction that I want to deal with is not so much mentoring in general as mentoring underrepresented groups. And not just that, but in particular, the issue I'll focus on is women in engineering. Now, I think a lot of what I say will be far more general than that. It's just that this has to do with the reason why I'm here and why I'm talking to you and the source of much of my information. So while I won't claim to be giving you a general speech on the topic, I think a lot of what I say has to do with mentoring in general and not with particular applications of it. The issue that I'd like to focus on is this statistic, and I suspect things haven't changed much since that statistic was computed, that something close to 8% of all of the PhDs in electrical engineering over a fair chunk of time um, granted to, were, were granted to women. Now, if you count their percentage in the general population, it's clear that something is out of kilter here. There are a lot of reasons, theoretical and practical, we could discuss for why that's the case. I think my focus is going to be what should be done about this to improve it, in particular how um, that relates to mentoring. But obviously one of the problems is there are not a whole lot of role models in faculties in engineering. And these are several statistics, some old, some gathered within the last 24 hours, which try and make the point and I guess you can sort of see where I would like to end up this talk. These are the exceptions. Um, University of Washington and Duke have tried very hard and been fairly successful. But there's hardly anybody close. They seem to have done much better than most people. Most of them are like this. And when I was pooling uh, several former students to try and put the statistics together, I was trying to get statistics at major research universities, and somebody came up with a 0% for University of Delaware. I questioned whether they were a major research university, and the former student said, well, probably not, but they should be humiliated anyway. <laughs> there are many universities which have none or only one. I'll point out that both Caltech and UCSD, who are near the bottom here, have one woman on their electrical engineering faculty. And whatever else you might think, that's got to be fairly difficult. Um, at Cornell, until fairly recently, there was only one, but they've moved up. Stanford has now three out of about 50, so they're doing a lot better. They had only one for a fairly long time. But these are the numbers that I think are fairly typical. I think those schools that try fairly hard tend to get something like around 10%. So that's generally considered good, but it's a long way from the percentage in the population. As you can probably guess, if I start looking not just at women, but, women, but underrepresented minorities in terms of ethnic backgrounds, things get even worse. Um, so I would argue there is a problem that is evident to see. And some of the issues I would like to deal with about how do we try and fix this problem, what can be done, are the three related issues, the latter one of which I'm going to focus on, but the other ones clearly have something to do with it. One is recruitment. How do you go out and find people? You don't do it by what some universities try now, is go to another university that has a really outstanding woman scientist and steal her. That helps your numbers and often doubles your numbers. It hurts them and the overall averages don't change. 
All I can really say about recruitment, and I'll talk a little bit about that, is really based on my own experience, which is dealing within the pool of students who come to graduate school and are thinking about academic careers and thinking about engineering. And I admit at the start, that's not where the real problem is. The big problems lie down in K-12, trying to get people to get through the undergraduate background they need to even get to graduate school. So my concern is sort of uh, assuming people get that far, what do we do? A lot of other people who are concerned about mentoring are much more focused on increasing the pool to everybody's benefit. The environment, as I will talk about, has a lot to do with it. And by that, I mean the academic environment within the research groups trying to have an environment that encourages diversity and gets lots of good people from various backgrounds. I have been challenged when I've given variations of this talk as to why is it I assume that diversity in a research group is a good thing. So I'll simply say now I take that as axiomatic. I can argue that offline. But clearly, I don't want to be looking at a bunch of people who look like I do. That's just not as interesting to me. So that I'm simply going to take as an axiom. Mentoring is what I'm going to talk about. And the goal of this talk is to spend something under an hour um, telling you about what I've learned and to tell you how I learned that and to explain why it is I'm here pretending to be an expert before you. I have to brag a bit. Now, I'm going to admit, they want us to do this. We're supposed to go out and blow our own horn and tell you about this award so you know about it. So um, while I can't claim I've got a surplus of modesty most of the time, this is consistent with the wishes of our government. So that's why I'm going to spend a moment being egotistical. But it also makes the strong lesson that awards often come with uh, constraints or obligations or responsibilities. As a friend once said, every silver lining has a cloud. And so I want to tell you the, the fun part and then tell you the more difficult part. Anyway, this is last March. Uh, the award was for 2002, but it was actually given in 2003. This is in the White House. This isn't the president. He was busy preparing to invade Iraq. He had other concerns. This whole situation was surreal because we were there essentially a couple of days before we went in. The security was immense, and I'm sure my family have a lifetime of stories about just how you got into the White House and little things like going into the room where you discovered you had to wait 45 minutes for security reasons and there were no toilets, and um, just a very crazy thing. But this was fun. This is the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, and this is the director of the National Science Foundation. So we had a, had a pretty good group of people there. The point of the award I've listed here because there is this subtitle that it is for mentoring, but it is of groups underrepresented in science, mathematics, and engineering. And the group I was mostly concerned with was women. Why? Because it was a bunch of my former women students who nominated me. They did go out and get some views from some of my men's students so they could make the point that I was not prejudiced against them, um, that it was not only the women. But in particular, it was a very academically successful group of women which included two who were the only women at their universities, two who were the first ever to be tenured in electrical engineering at their universities. So in some ways, they were pioneers. I'll mention a few, uh, make a few more comments about them later on. But they had done very well. Uh, they were very happy with what their experience had been. And so they decided to put me up for this award, which was one. And then the catch comes here. I'm supposed to be an exemplar or a role model to a, uh, colleagues and a leader in the effort to develop uh, the nation's human resources. The award came with a grant of 10,000 bucks and a commitment to spend it on what the uh, nomination said we would spend it on. And they had decided that that would be a workshop on mentoring, which will be held at Stanford in June. I'll end up my talk telling you a little bit more about that for people who might be interested. So basically, I received the nice award in the White House with my kids there. It was great. As Michelle said, it was a high point of, of my life, really. But it also meant I had to put together, organize, run a workshop. Um, so that was a, a bit of an extra uh, burden on time and effort. And I guess it also put me in a position that I'll talk a bit uh, about later of 
basically trying to lead an effort while I'm trying to learn what the effort is all about. So one other catch that I should mention is as part of this, there was a forum on mentoring. We all had to give a talk. So since I hadn't a clue what to say, I had to find out what I was going to give my talk on and what I was going to say. So I basically went to all of my students, which I like the idea of the mentors being mentored by the mentees. That is, I had to find out why um, I got the award, what they thought was good, what they thought was bad. This basically started a series of conversations um, enhanced by putting on, um, by arranging to put on the workshop. And I should mention that this award also garnered other speaking invitations. So I ended up speaking at other universities at forums on mentoring. So there I was really being put in front of people who had taken mentoring very seriously for a long time. And as a new kid on the block, had to try and get up to speed very rapidly. But what this did bring up was one subject that allows the geek in me to come out and have a talk and not risk having a talk with no block diagrams in it. <laughs> and that, that was the idea of feedback because what I was doing in hindsight was just exactly what I was supposed to be doing and to some extent had been unconsciously doing before that. And that was basically learning from former students how their experience had been and actually staying as a mentor for years after I thought the job was somewhat over. In some ways, it's kind of like kids. Any of you who, like me, have kids who are now in their mid-30s to 40s are suddenly discovering yourself shocked to realize parenting never ends. Um, it, there may be sort of a lull in the middle, but it, it goes on. And, and with students, it's somewhat very similar. The difference is that my grandkids are a lot younger than my grand students. The generations are faster, so there are more of them. But the point is, once they go away, you stay in touch and you learn. And actually, there are several things you learn, some obvious, maybe some not so obvious. One is you really measure your success, because as they fail or succeed, you can't take the blame or the credit for any of that, but you certainly had an influence. And it's certainly in everybody's benefit if they succeed. So everybody is trying to work that out. Another aspect which I'm more conscious of now is just listening carefully about what things worked for them, didn't work for them, their experiences in building their own research groups and in mentoring other people. And now, doing things like coming here to try and share some of this with people, admitting a lot of it is obvious or simplistic, but it doesn't seem to be widespread. That is, a lot of things that we all should be doing and everybody will nod their heads when I say we should be doing this, um, isn't always being done. And I say that because that's what I'm hearing from the, the students who are out there and the former students. Okay, so what I'd like to do for the bulk of the time is go through a few pages of basically bullets, raising issues. They maybe are loosely correlated with uh, priority, but not really, because there's some pretty important ones toward the end. So in a way, you can sort of take it as a random introduction. This I should explain. Before I gave a talk at the Mentoring Forum in University of Washington, uh, there was a group who had been on faculty search committees, and they had just had two or three outstanding faculty candidates who were women come through who all came from Jeff Kosef's group. So they said, don't just talk about you, please. Go find out what he's doing right and come tell us about that as well which um, happily they told me this before I gave the talk, so I did. And so this has been somewhat influenced by his experience as well. So while a lot of people have been involved in this, and I think most of this I can say comes from information taken from former Stanford women PhD students who are now active faculty members, um, there are other influences as well, including Jeff Kosef. Okay, the environment. All right. This is pretty much a no-brainer. You'd like to have a comfortable, friendly, cooperative, and productive environment with the best possible resources for all students. This can sort of go with the cooperation, which is what you don't want is kind of cutthroat, aggressive competition, which some faculty I've known figure is good for students, and it teaches them how to survive in the outside world, those that survive it. Um, but I guess. 
I recently gave a historical talk about digital speech and the internet and its development in the 1970s. And there were two very contrasting styles. One was the style that essentially led to what is called speech coding. And here was a case where all sorts of universities, industries, and other groups were all funded to work together cooperatively. They all became lifelong friends. They're still lifelong friends, and they did wonders. The other group was in the area of speech recognition, which is, you know, you talk at it and the machine understands you. And their DARPA and its wisdom gave out five enormous grants and told them at the start, three of you will get new funding after it. And you can imagine what happened. There came cutthroat competition, redundancy, uh, infighting, and I think not very good science. So I guess one point is you can be a capitalist, that's fine. But if you're trying to train people and have a research environment where they're going to prosper and grow, I don't think uh, uh, a pit with everybody, you know, only the fittest survive, is the right way to do it. Cooperative research can often produce vastly better and more results. So it's simply a better idea. Here I can also mention this may be obvious again, but this is the view of several women of what they saw lacking in many places and where they found it, that was where they gravitated towards. Okay, so I've really pretty much said this. I perceive often in other research groups a tendency for people to keep their advances to themselves, to feel very competitive, um, to basically be secretive and, heck, selfish. And I think that's actually counterproductive, and that's not, intellect, that's not how to put it. Um, intelligent selfishness. That is, they may think it's better for them in the short run, but it's certainly not better for the group, nor is it better for them in the long run. This basically takes a fair effort, I think, by the research group leader. The other things that I'm, I'm kind of always sorry to have to talk about is this business about politeness and diplomacy skills. Okay, every generation realizes that the young have no skills in terms of privacy. They're rude. They don't listen, they don't talk, they don't treat people properly. And when you realize how many generations this has been going on, it's amazing that there isn't any, anything less. Still, I perceive this, and I find it unacceptable in a research group. I pride myself to being able to work, as I often do in administration, with complete jerks. I know you're all surprised to find there exist any in an academic environment. But they do and they take a great deal of patience. I won't say I never lose my temper, but I only lose it under very guarded circumstances when I figure the only way I can succeed politically is to frighten somebody, because they know how rarely I get angry. So if I'm getting angry, something's really, really long, wrong. A lot of people just don't understand this, that you, you know, if you treat people that you don't want to socialize with reasonably well, you can have just a perfectly fine time working with them. Uh, and you might even be wrong. It might turn out they're more interesting than you thought, and you might actually develop a relationship past that. And certainly diplomacy, just basic stuff, like you don't want to go out and upset your contract monitor, your dean, or lots of other people, that you have to have certain skills, and it takes some development, and that's really part of this cooperation. And again, this is something that a lot of former students found lacking in many groups. Okay, recruitment. And here, I guess, the point is, a lot of people would like to have diverse groups, but they never have, and they just figure that's because they've never seen anybody, or um, they've, it just hasn't happened that way. The pool's too small. There are lots of excuses. But the fact is they still have a non-diverse group. One point that's made frequent, frequently is that, especially when you're starting from a group that has no diversity, it's going to be really difficult for new people to come in. The only way that's going to happen is if a real effort is made. Somebody's going to have to be the first. If you can build up press to critical mass and all goes well, then maybe you'll be able to keep it that way for a while. But sometimes it takes active recruitment, and that doesn't mean you're going for second class or second rate for the sole function of having diversity. That means you're paying more attention for the diamonds in the rough, and this is intelligent selfishness. Because if you're doing that, you find the diamonds in the rough instead of your colleagues finding them. There may be people who are simply shy, lack confidence, or concerned about their abilities, 
confidence is what I will get into next, and you take them in and they blossom, and it's wonderful. But if you weren't paying attention, specifically when you were talking to people who might improve the diversity in your group, you'd have missed it entirely. Okay, confidence. Um, basically, I said this already. Many students, and I think this is, I would say, most common among the potential new women students I've had, especially through 70s, 70s, 80s, early 90s. That may be getting a little bit better. But do lack confidence. And that has to be recognized by a research supervisor, and you have to find out, basically, what it is they really know, what they can do, and provide an opportunity for the person to demonstrate their skills. And again, this is intelligently selfish, because if they are successful, um, it's to everybody's benefit. This other added bit, when we have this workshop this summer, we will be having a professional speaker on this topic. But I've been reading it up, reading up on it on the web, and I have been entertained by it because it's something I've seen a lot of my students and others, and even myself, when I'm given an inter introduction like Michelle gave me. Um, the so-called imposter syndrome, which is no matter what you've done, no matter what your credentials are, or how good the world has said you are, you're always pretty sure you're a fraud. It's just that nobody's found it out so far. <laughs> and you're an imposter. You shouldn't be there. And in fact, there have been psychological studies that verify getting more accolades and more successes doesn't help. It just makes you more convinced that you haven't been found out yet and makes you feel worse. And this is something that you know, this PhD has made a lifetime of giving lectures and workshops on this. So actually, we're going to have her at the tail end of our mentoring workshop, and we'll try and get a bigger room to throw that open to the community at large and advertise it in late June. So if you see the imposter syndrome coming up again, this is where you heard about it. But this is something that seems to ring a sympathetic chord with a lot of graduate students, with a lot of underrepresented minorities in particular, just because that's the opinion that's sort of thrust on them, that you, know, you have your opportunities not because you're smart, but because somebody is trying to be diverse, and too many people are willing to swallow that. Okay, credibility, very short, but that's actually a fairly deep issue, and one place where I think people like me talking about mentoring will be different from those who have an experience in running mentoring programs. And that's basically, if you're going to be credible as a mentor, you have to have a reputation and a career that looks like you've been succeeding at what it is that you're trying to teach them. That is, a professional staff person running an excellent mentoring program can't serve as a role model in the specific area that the student wants to go in. It has to be somebody writing papers, writing books, giving talks, and having a certain reputation within their technical field. And often, the trouble is that the people who are succeeding in all of those things are so busy doing those things, they're not really thinking about the mentoring aspect. So what's good is when they're at least keeping it in mind and realizing that they're probably the best mentors because they've done that well themselves. Granted, you can have the isolated, aloof, sometimes arrogant scientists and engineers who are very famous, very difficult to live with, but you know they've earned that right in their view, so if you want to learn from them, that's your problem. And there are a few of us who are hardy enough to put up with that, but not most people, especially people who lack confidence. So part of being a mentor is just doing your job and not just doing only mentoring. OK, integrity, um, ethics. Talk to your students, and I think you may find out that most graduate students don't take the honor code very seriously. I take it very seriously, and I get upset with them when I hear comments that are cynical about it. Um, I have been involved, unfortunately, with a few judicial cases that had to do with the fundamental standard, um, or have had to do with cheating. We can't simply rest on our laurels of being a great university and think that doesn't happen here. It does happen. 
This is a place in particular where I think it's important that faculty role models not dismiss such things. Ethics are very important. Every now and then, even the public reading about Enron and the like understand this. Um, you can't take people necessarily at their word. It's nice to be trusting, but it's nice also to convince students that things like plagiarism, borrowing research results, or claiming things that you really don't have a right to claim. I am aware of cases where professors have been uh, accused by students of stealing their results. Students have been accused by other students of stealing their results. That is a bad environment. And I think simply emphasizing engineering ethics, something I'll add the ABET accreditation organization pushes very strongly on. Stanford teaches courses in it. And even if it's only brief contacts with worrying about these things, I think it's very important. One thing several of my former students said that impressed them about the research group was that ethics were held to a very high standard, and it just got built in to them when they went off to run their own groups elsewhere. Communication skills. All right, it's great to have your students speak many languages, but one of them better be English if they're going to get a Stanford degree. There is no excuse for a student getting a PhD who cannot speak functional English or write functional English. I think professors, mentors should be ruthless in correcting and making students, as I do, go take courses in technical writing and basic English. I've even had a lot of students go in for Toastmasters just for practicing public speaking on things that have nothing to do with technical. We're doing them no favor if we produce students who basically can't communicate with others, no matter how brilliant they are in terms of research. If others can't understand it, generally they're not going to succeed. There may, again, be a few exceptions of people who are just such geniuses that even complete articulateness will not stop them from succeeding. But that's rare. In general, I think it's just critical. I'm not trying to be chauvinist here, but if you're getting a degree in an English-speaking country, and expect to work there, then your English should be essentially perfect. Chores and citizenship. This is something that I think is kind of hard. I know I don't always do as good a job at it as I would like. It's kind of hard because it's usually simpler if you get 20 papers to review for a conference if you just sit down and go through them yourself. You give them to students, they write reviews, they don't really know the literature, they don't know how to write a review, then you have to review the reviews and redo it. So this is something I confess in years when I'm feeling somewhat overloaded like this one, I haven't done as much as I'd like. But in the past, in the standard, I like to try for is to force students to review the papers and then critique their re reviews, get them involved in it. Now in the long run, this can help. Because in the long run, when you get swamped by stuff like this, or if you're on a program committee, um, if you're running a conference which is going to have a thousand papers, and you know, maybe 30 or 40 of them won't get adequate reviews because your reviewers punk out. That means the program committee chairs, uh, like I am right now, basically have to find local help in doing it. And I don't really want to read 30 or 40 papers. So if I've got some students who are familiar with the field, that's a big help. Plus it prepares them for a career in it. Um, whenever I write grant proposals, my students have to help. I don't tell them to write a proposal. I've had one student, I think, in 33 years who actually wrote their own proposal, submitted it with my name on it because they needed a faculty person, and it got funded. I, mean, I thought it was almost a joke, but when it got funded, this was now my student, and he was working on what he got the money to, find, to, to, to work on. Proposal writing, reviewing, presentations. Um, making students give lots and lots of oral presentations. If they're going to give a talk at a conference and they're inarticulate, it makes you look bad. So you make them talk before the group and simulate real conferences. You interrupt them <laughs> or your students interrupt them. Make it hard. Get used to all of the delays and all of the questions, sometimes semi-hostile, that come in from nowhere. They will then be a whole lot better prepared to do themselves, you, and the group credit when they're going out there and giving presentations. Recruiting. Nobody recruits other students 
better than the students who are working with you if they're fairly happy at what they're doing. And mentoring. Um, that's something I didn't realize, I think, until recently, just how much mentoring goes on between the senior students in a group and the junior students in a group. And that's a very good thing. Okay, professional visibility. Um, one thing I always try and find the money for, even in hard times, is the money to send students off to conferences. If they can get a paper accepted, then I will do it, always. If they don't have a paper, then I'm happy to do it. If it's local, I will think twice before sending them to Europe because that's expensive and not clearly the best way to spend the money. But if they're giving a paper or if it's a joint paper, say with me, I'd much rather have them give it than me. Partially this is looking towards the future when I hope to travel less to conferences I don't really want to go to. Um, but even currently, it's great practice for them, gets them up in front of people. When students give posters, I usually try and hang around, but I let them do the bulk of the work. Basically, they're under the gun. They're under fire, and they build up skills. And as I've mentioned, I'm talking about a reasonably narrow group I'm trying to mentor. There are people who want to become professors, and they better have good speaking skills, including under fire, if they're going to go out and give talks to try and get jobs for search committees, for example. It's just great practice to do that. Um, introducing them to colleagues, uh, my students say that I did that a whole lot. I wasn't really aware of it. Um, but they met lots of people, and that led to networking. That sometimes led to jobs. It often led to interesting new research projects. And they just felt included. And that is a very good feeling. Um, after graduation, you know, this may sound like punishment, but you recommend them for all sorts of unpleasant chores that they're going to have to do if this is the career they want. Because sometimes they don't get noticed and people don't ask them unless it's suggested that they do. So if they're picked on for stuff like that, they get known, it means more rapid um, acquisition of things like becoming an associate editor of some technical journal on the program committees of international journals, or pardon me, international conferences. And again, that just enhances their experience and plugs them into the profession. Okay, credit. Um, I have had some colleagues who I think overmuch claim credit for things their students had done. And I'm sure I've made the mistake of doing that in my career as well. But as a guideline, I try not to do that, and I try and give as much credit to the students as I possibly can, usually because they merit it. In stuff that is joint, almost all of the joint papers that I've written with students, my name has not been first, and that's really an accurate reflection of who did most of the work. There have been a couple of exceptions to that, but that was really a case where I thought it was clear I had done something, and they'd come in to help, and this was given as recognition for it. Um, but in general, at my age, I'm too busy to do as much research as I would like. The students are doing the bulk of it, except for you know, a couple of things I do for the fun of it, and they should get credit for it. And as people who know me, uh, if I feel a student has done some result that's really neat, and then I find somebody else claiming that they invented it, um, I can be pretty ferocious in defending their not mentioning what I consider to be prior work. And that has happened uh, a non-trivial number of times. So I think sometimes we really have to defend our students because if they come up against somebody really big and famous in the field who might or might not have actually borrowed the ideas, sometimes it's independent, but there have been cases where I've known students have gone around given talks and then somebody else at an institution they visited has suddenly submitted a paper on the subject. Um, that takes some watching out for, and it's us older folks, I think, sometimes who really have to step in and defend their rights. Um, attitude, this is, I guess, sort of a summary of several of the other things that I've said. If you're going to have a diverse group and do a good job of mentoring, you just have to be paying attention all the time. And that gets really hard when you're overcommitted with all of the things that Stanford professors are overcommitted with. But it's good to keep getting reminded of it and to talk about it and to keep it in mind because 
often you don't really need to spend another 15 minutes on you know, filling out committee work. It can wait and there's some more critical issue where you've got to deal with students and that can have a big long-term payoff for just the reasonable effort at the time. Okay, this is the topic that I usually am most reluctant to talk about. It seems everybody's reluctant to talk about. And that's specifically the one topic that I'm thinking of women graduate students at this point and women faculty members. I think the whole world is much more aware of sexual harassment than they used to be, uh, but it's not going away. If you just talk to the people who are in the trenches, it's still there. It's gotten more subtle and more hidden and often more difficult to deal with. And I always stick this in just because it's something that is unacceptable and if you encounter it, uh, even if it's uh, being expressed in, let's see, how did our governor put it, playful, unquote, ways, um, that doesn't make it any more acceptable and people should be called on it and confronted on it. And complaints along this line should be taken very seriously. Um, I have had to deal with such complaints. That's not to say that uh, a federal case should be made out of every complaint, but certainly the situation should get fixed so the whatever it was that led to the opportunity for that complaint should never occur again. Um, and if it is something that's done in public, the person, um, I guess I've made some enemies by making observations in public about that, but I, I have no regrets on that score in any of the cases that I can, can recall. Sometimes a behavior is unacceptable and it should be labeled as such. The follow-up, that's almost where I began. The mentoring doesn't stop with a degree. Students become your colleagues and you can really help them become better colleagues. One thing I found is getting my own former graduate students to come back and talk to my current graduate students does an excellent job. I don't have to say anything. People just see other people who have succeeded. They have additional role models. They make additional contacts. And usually you can get uh, alumni from your groups to uh, come back without having to spend too much money because they're looking for an excuse. For an example, the workshop we'll be holding in June will have several Stanford PhDs who are looking forward and paying their own way to come back and see each other and to just try and talk to future generations of people and give them a hand as well. Also, another thing that is a problem with the follow-up is sometimes students will go into a situation where they really have no local mentors. I do not think that you need to have a mentor who is exactly like you are. And I think some school, I mean, if you have only one woman in EE who is a professor and you get a bunch of graduate students who are women, you can't kill off your professor by having her do it all for all of the women. You have to go to other groups who are at least sympathetic towards the plight and willing to listen to do some of that mentoring. But even with that, some schools just won't have anybody who's able to fill in there. So sometimes we mentor people past their actual degree. Ideally, they will eventually acquire a mentor at the new place or by taking advantage of some resources I mentioned, we'll hook up with people more local. In that case, we become sort of secondary mentors, just providing an outside opinion. But it's really tough for some people who go to a new place to start from scratch. Okay, winding down with some parting thoughts. Uh, again, I apologize at the beginning. I think a lot of what I said is obvious or simplistic, but it's not ubiquitous. It's just not done in a lot of groups and by a lot of people. And so explaining these things to people and getting people to talk about some of these issues I think helps. And again, I'm sort of under orders to do so. That's uh, part of uh, what got me here. Um, how can individuals and organizations help? Well, one way is to promote events that spread the word, get people involved, bring in more people. You know, the obvious disadvantage is probably the people who could use this the most aren't here. But if more people are just aware of these issues, they can bring them up in other forums. And there are lots of places where things are discussed. Um, the PACE MEM, the uh, almost unpronounceable acronym, which uh, I described earlier, is one mechanism for promoting it. 
every time they give the award, they have the forum. Usually it gets lots of press coverage. Usually, usually they have lots of reporters there. Unfortunately, competing with the invasion of Iraq uh, somewhat diminished that. They were all at another part of the White House, not in the executive offices. And so what we got were reporters from science and uh, nature and other places like that. But usually they do a better job of it. There are National Science Foundation programs that are involved with improving the lot of underrepresented minorities in education in general. Um, they have programs at many universities, including the University of Washington and Duke, who are the two that are doing so well that I described before. Um, just, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to spread the word and proselytize a bit here. Um, workshops. We're going to be having a joint PACEMEM Stanford School of Engineering workshop. The idea was when Jim Plummer discovered I got 10K from the NSF and the White House is he matched it. So we basically have 20K and what we're doing is we're holding a workshop that will have senior, middle, and junior faculty and grad students. So far, we've not advertised it widely because simply word of mouth has been enough to almost fill. However, um, what we're doing is we're charging no admission, no fees, and we're providing housing for everybody that we think needs it. Hopefully most of the old folks can manage their own, so the housing will be for uh, people from poor universities or junior professors, people without funding. Our hope is if we pay for the housing, they can embarrass their administration into paying for the air flight. Um, so we're hoping not to do too much of that. But we will let people know about uh, around Stanford know about it. If you're curious about the workshop, we have a list of topics in the organizing committee. And we're proceeding slowly but uh, steadily. The website for the workshop is there. We're not trying to establish a dynasty of a series of workshops. We're going to use the money we got to throw one. And our thought is then if people like it, somebody else can throw the next one. I don't want to be in this business permanently. But so far, everybody seems to be very enthusiastic in the ideas to get senior mentors talking to junior mentors, having mentees there, and a variety of topics that have mostly been suggested by my former students and the people they've talked to. Another thing um, you can do, and these slides are all on the web. Uh, just uh, that was on the front page. I'll try and remember to go back to it so you can copy it down if you're interested. You don't need to copy all of these things down. One thing I learned in the process was about MentorNet, which is uh, essentially a means of hooking up uh, primarily women, but not only women, with mentors in industry, academia, at various levels. It works very well. It's run by Carol Moeller. Currently, no, it's located down in San Jose. She'll be at the workshop participating in one of the panel. And then several organizations that either I've encountered or my students have encountered. The website for the Wix group seems to be dead. So if somebody knows a new one, I'd be happy to learn about that. The other ones I verified. There are lots of programs. And it's really a question of finding one that uh, matches individual interests. But there are places to go look. And there are places that are fairly local to go look. OK, just to sort of, I guess this is kind of an ending and a beginning. I like to show this. University of Washington is a, a place that's done pretty well. Um, this is Mari Ostendorf. She was the first woman to ever graduate from my group. And she had an endowed chair before I did, which I've always been impressed by. Um, this is Eve Riskin, also from my group. This is Maya Gupta, very just last year uh, started at the University of Washington. Um, this is Dee Dee Meldrum. She was in Joe Goodman's group. So you'll notice almost half of all of the women on the University of Washington faculty came from Stanford. So Stanford's not doing too badly in this. This does point out the uh, advantages of networking because when they were looking for new faculty, they went to various people, which included me, to, to suggest people and, and look for them. I also like to point out that this is the dean. She didn't go to Stanford. She went to MIT. Um, but I think she's done a really good job. She's coming to the workshop, as I hope are all, all these three. And so that really is, I think, where I end. So let me go back to the start. And end by just 
saying the common theme here was feedback. I had to learn on the fly. I got anointed as an expert in something I didn't think I knew anything about. Uh, I'm vastly more aware of this now, and uh, I can invite people who are interested. If you're, more, if you're curious about the workshop we'll be holding, just get in touch with me or check out the website, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much for listening. I haven't perceived a threshold where all of a sudden everything improves. I've seen it's more a question of people of like constant feedback and adapting to it and getting used to it. It's like the imposter syndrome. Mo in, in fact, for senior faculty uh, or for historical workshops like I just went to, people in their 60s are still muttering to themselves about how they still get nervous or worried before a talk because it matters to them. They never get over that. They just learn really to deal with it. So I think the holding to standards is more of a constant monitoring, constant feedback. I don't see that at some point there's sort of a cure where people get it and all of a sudden it's okay. In fact, there's almost a danger. You might think you've got it, and you sort of get lulled into overconfidence and forget, and you could get bit that way. Yeah. I guess I don't know exactly how to answer that because I've counseled my own students at times to be subtle when they came up against things, that they should deal with them, they should not pretend it didn't exist, but don't, you know, if, if you raise a hubbub politically and diplomatically, it will very likely hurt you, and unless you want to be a martyr, that's not a good idea. But sometimes there are other people at more influential levels you can bring in to help. Uh, I can't say all of my students have followed that advice. I can think of some infant instances where, you know, in hindsight, I think they were right. There were some pretty egregious things going on, and they challenged them openly, directly. And at least because of a climate of trying to fix those problems, she incurred the enmity of only the people she stood up against and not against the bulk of her, her colleagues. That's got to be a tough call and an individual call by each instance. But I guess that goes to my point that sometimes these horrible things still happen. They're not gone. And a lot of my colleagues simply won't believe that things like that happen, that, they're, that some of their colleagues and friends can um, you know, have grudges or have prejudices uh, and act on them. <laughs> I, 
I mean, that's, that's the sort of thing that keeps me awake at night when I know I have to tell somebody that there is a problem and they're not going to like hearing about it. Um, I, I have no magic bullet on, <laughs> on, on that, I'm afraid. I think the main thing is, uh, again, not, not to go into denial and, and let it pass because you're not doing anybody any favor. For example, if a student is uh, being aggressive among their peers and making other people feel bad and not doing their fair share of the you know, computer maintenance and uh, just taking care of the office and other such stuff, um, there are, if it gets to a certain point, I have to step in. And there have been happily rare incidences where I've had a couple of students who've had problems between themselves and basically they're both right so they want me to settle it and those can be very difficult because usually there's some right and wrong on both sides and the overriding issue is they either have to work it out maybe with help uh, but it's disrupting the group it can't continue so <laughs> they have a basic choice and they have to make a decision on it and invariably it's going to cost me a few hours of sleep before I get around to being that firm with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, certainly the ones who nominated me for the award have to. Um, all of the, all of them, basically, uh, I think, confided in me and I think I tried hard to respond in a reasonable manner but I got feedback which included times that I was all wet or didn't understand um, I think the main thing was that both sides tried and that I made a point of listening and when somebody reminded me that I've just told them for the sixth time that well not now let's try again tomorrow um, I found time so persistence, I guess, is what I would say. Also, none of them ever came across, in my view, as being belligerent or antagonistic when doing this. Um, I've had a lot of students who are just gently persistent. The, the voice stayed there until the necessary action was taken or decision was taken. Um, that they knew I was busy and that there were all of these other things going on, but nonetheless, something needed attention, and it hadn't gotten it to that point. The other thing I think that students could do is as they became senior students, they did a fair amount of the mentoring themselves, especially of the junior students. Now, almost out of habit, when a student comes in and wants to know what we're doing or give it a try, I refer them to older students to uh, basically get what articles, books, et cetera, that are the quickest, fastest way to learn about the field and to chat with the students about what they're doing. Um, so in a way, that's sort of passing the buck a bit. But it's, it's taking advantage of the knowledge my senior students have gained. And then I highly respect the knowledge of my senior students when I'm deciding whether to accept a new student in my group. And when I talk with students about joining the group, I make a case that um, I don't accept new students essentially without the consensus of the older students. That it is not just between me and the student, it's really joining the group and it's important to me to keep the existing group reasonably happy. Yeah.
there was feedback to the effect that I think I briefly touched on on the start that the, the, the women who nominated me wisely got the opinions of a few men students who felt that the things they were nominating me for had been equally shared with the men. So um, there were some, I guess I would say I found out years later, weren't as confident as I thought they were, but had been very happy with the uh, reinforcement that they'd gotten with the group. So I, I think what I would probably say is I paid more attention where I was concerned that there was a problem. And I don't, my attention paying didn't seem to have been perceived <laughs> by the men in the group. That is, they, they saw no unfairness in how they or the others were being treated. So um, yes, some evidence. I would say also not just the fact that some don't express it, but that if you subdivide the minority, you know, if, if I consider women who are also minorities, the confidence problems seem to get even worse. And so I, for this workshop, for example, it was pointed out by people very active in that area that we did not have a good minority representation and we better go out and find one if we wanted to be credible. And that's hard just because there are, are very few uh, Hispanic and black women in engineering on faculties and even fewer of them were in a position of authority like department chairs and deans. We have a department chair, we have a dean, and we have some junior faculty coming. Um, so we hope we've done a reasonable sampling for the workshop to bring out issues like that. We have and we're, we're having some men come as well. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.